Welcome to an emergency edition of the Litigation Psychology Podcast brought to you by Courtroom Sciences. I'm Dr. Bill Kanaski coming at you from Las Vegas, Nevada, here for a pretty big trucking conference uh, over a two-day period. I will be on stage for seven hours a day, so um, a lot of uh, teaching going on. My hips, my knees, and my feet are not going to appreciate that. However, emergency podcast because uh, the hottest news in the legal industry uh, comes out of Florida this week, uh, my home state and my guest's home state. And we're talking about House Bill 837 that Governor DeSantis signed. And my two guests uh, today are uh, two good friends and two uh, great uh, clients, Serena Fallon and Matt Caseman. Guys, how you doing? Good. Hey. So I'm walking through the, cause, so I had to go down and get some breakfast. But getting here was a disaster, just a disaster, right? So I get here really, really late, about midnight, and I have a Zoom witness prep at 8 a.m. this morning. And with the time change, so I just got no sleep. So I'm just a disaster. And I'm walking through the casino to go get some coffee. And there's this dude in one of those like scooters, like the, you know, the motor scooter things, right? And he's at the slots, and I mean, just he's hammering down marble reds and just nailing this slot over and over and over. I just can't imagine um, um, what 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 that would what, what would what that would be like. If I end up like that, <laughs> one of you one of you please shoot me. Um, but but uh, like my, yeah yeah please. Uh, they work with the Ragsdale Liggett firm out of uh, Jacksonville. Florida, and we're going to tell you about our Jacksonville, Florida football story uh, regarding the Jaguars' incredible uh, comeback win in the NFL playoffs that we uh, attended together. But first things first, Serena, uh, this this bill kind of it kind of came out of nowhere. I feel like everybody's just like, "Wait, what the hell's going on?" And then it got signed really quick, and um, LinkedIn and Twitter, everybody's gone into a panic. Uh, I think both on the plaintiff and defense side, but for roughly different reasons. Um, it, uh, rumor has, I think this is confirmed, that Morgan and Morgan filed roughly 25,000 lawsuits uh, right before this deadline. And I think what I'm hearing is something about 90 to 100,000 were filed uh, collectively by the plaintiff's bars in Florida. Uh, can you please outline uh, the bill at kind of a higher uh, a level and, and what's going on in the state of Florida? This is really, really important. Sure. Um, yes, this is huge. It's huge for um, the defense bar. It's huge for the um, insurance industry. This is something that um, I honestly didn't think we would ever see. Um, and so um, this is great for us. Um, potentially bad for us is probably going to lower some of our litigation and some of our cases. But um, some of the big points, um, obviously, are the statute of limitations changed in this for general negligence, which goes from four years to two years. That's, that is a big thing for us. What we see a lot of times is that plaintiffs go and they treat for long periods of time. They increase the value of their cases um, and their medical bills. So now they are having to rush, kind of get their treatment and get into litigation pretty quickly. Um, that additionally kind of takes me into something which is more significant for us is the medical bills. Um, the new law limits the amount of evidence of the past medical bills to which has been paid rather than what was billed. Up until now, plaintiffs have been entitled to board all of their medical bills. And the jury basically had been um, seeing 500,000 or 300,000 um, large amount of bills when maybe they only owe $25,000. And so what that does is it fabricates a story and it produces larger verdicts. It produces larger future medical bills. It creates larger past and future uh, pain and suffering. And then you basically get into these nuclear type verdicts. So essentially the bill says if you have health insurance um, and the contract or, or any of contribution or um, copay or deductible, that's what is admissible, not what actually is billed. If you, and then they go through, if you have um, health insurance, but you choose to use a letter of protection, which is another avenue which plaintiffs have used an agreement between the doctors and the attorneys and their clients to basically help 
um, build up their cases. So they can basically uh, put any amount of cost in their treatment and, and inflate these billing these medical bills and so now they're saying no you can't you still have to reduce it to what typically the health care bill would have paid or what medicare would have basically uh, could had the cost of it if you don't have health insurance then they look at the medicare bill or medicaid depending on whether or not you know the medical um the medicare basically the evidence of 100 20 percent of medicare um, reimbursement and if there is if that's not applicable then they look at 100 and 70% of the applicable state Medicare. So it's huge um, because what we have been seeing is that juries are have not been entitled to learn the truth. They're, it's kind of basically balancing out the playing field for us where we're not going in there and hiding things in front of a jury. We're actually showing them, hey, the bills are no longer 300,000, they're 25,000. And therefore that goes into future medical bills. If a plaintiff has health coverage, or is eligible for help coverage, the only evidence of the amount for which future charges could be satisfied if submitted to the such health care coverage, include, including copay and deductible, is admissible. And if there's no health care, then only evidence of 120% of Medicare reimbursement rate is in fact claimant will receive or no Medicare rate, then it's 170% applicable Medicare Medicaid rate and um, that is admissible. So, um, it's like I said, it just basically places us in a position that we're no longer having to go into litigation um, and we're able to look at these cases and resolve them more so pre-suit. And one of the things that's also going to do, which we've had to do a lot recently, is we've had to hire medical billing experts to basically discuss the appropriateness, the reasonableness, and necessity of these bills. We're seeing like they're basically taking these bills and they're inflating them. They're unfortunately for them, they're becoming, they're going to be obsolete. Um, and we've had to hire some recently a lot. It's discouraging unnecessary treatment and surgeries. We've been saying it for a long time. People don't believe it, but it is true. Uh, plaintiffs are getting ongoing untreat, you know, treatment that is unnecessary. We think it will uh, increase likelihood of pre-suit settlements. Um, it will decrease, hopefully, nuclear verdicts. And you know, even life care plans. We think that that's going to reduce the value of those um, long term. And and even though I think life uh, letters of protection may still be necessary to some extent, I think that you're not going to see them as much as well. So um, this yeah, um, this is this is really ground shaking for uh, the defense bar uh, in the state of Florida. So so Matt, if if you're a plaintiff attorney, a what. <laughs> What went through your mind when you figured this out? You know, hey, this is actually happening. And B, what what do you see the plaintiffs bar doing going forward uh, with such a uh, shift here in the uh, politics of the state? Well, the first thing is, is probably thinking like, okay, we need to rethink our business plan. Um, because as Serena mentioned, uh, you know, even with the statute, breaking it down to the statute of limitations, going from four years to two years, some would say they strategically build up as much uh, medical costs as they can before filing suit. Um, yeah. But even in terms of uh, the actual letters of protection that are going to be used, the letters of protection now have an even stricter uh, code that they have to adhere by. I'm looking it up right now. Um, it has to be itemized and coded uh, with the medical American Medical Association's current procedural terminology. So before letters of protection were kind of just standard, you know, we promise to pay you back when we recover, whatever. Now there's actual, you know, enumerated, you know, um, basically enumerated uh, uh, legislation that they have to, to adhere to. So again, medical coding, they have to list, uh, you know, if and, you know, which attorney that may have referred them. That There's just a whole bunch of things here included in the new legislation that, that they have to meet, even if they're going to use a letter of protection. So it's a, it's a big shift in... in yeah. Again, where I think it became in the law was signed on the 24th. So it's, I'm sure there's some scrambling going on right now. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's certainly going to get, um, it's certainly going to get crazy. Um, so, um, so at your law firm, Ragsdale uh, Liggett, have you, so once you figured out this was going to happen, then it happened. Do you like, do you have a team meeting? Like, okay. Uh, <laughs> 
um, we're in for a big change here because it's, it's going to be a change in Everything. volume of things to do staffing. I mean, how, and I'm and you're not the only firm, I, all the defense firms are going through this big, medium, small, what has been your kind of internal discussions on how to, how to deal with this? Because in the very, very near future, um, it's, it's kind of going to be a circus, isn't it? It actually already is. We've already started seeing it. We actually spent today, well, last week we actually submitted, you know, correspondence to our clients, letting them know this bill, letting them know, hey, by the way, start being heads up. You're probably going to get some lawsuits. We spent today actually looking at our cases, our pre-suit cases, and determine what cases already went into lawsuit. We have at least, I think, eight or nine that we've seen thus far. We've submitted all of those to our clients because, of course, what they're saying, what plaintiff's attorneys are saying, we're going to file them. We're not sure if we're going to serve them. We're going to see if we can possibly resolve them um, before we actually serve them. And, and that's, you know, obviously they just wanted to get in before the law became effective. Yeah. For, for the, the policy other, limits. Exactly. The policy exactly. Limits. Well, yeah. Until bad faith has now changed, bad faith has changed, obviously, making it more difficult for them. The other issue is, you know, now we have cases where things are going to change. So like today we got a case in a, um, a letter, um, you know, a, a letter of representation and now compared to false change. So now we're modified state. So it used to be, even if you, even if the plaintiff was at fault, they were still entitled to money. Now, if the plaintiff is 51% at fault, they're not entitled to anything. That's huge. Now that's, that's absolute game changer right there. Now, do you know, in Alabama, do you know in Alabama, it's 1%? The plaintiff Ooh. is 1% at fault in Alabama. You can't recover, wow. right? So yeah, I guess that, yeah. Going back to what you previously asked me, I guess when evaluating cases now, before yes. in Florida, plaintiff's attorneys, I mean, they just, anything that walked through the door was a paycheck, but they got to really rethink that now. Because as soon as you hit that 51% threshold, it's it's nothing. Yeah, and they could get zero, they could get zeroed out by a jury really, really fast. And so I, I imagine, um, yeah, it's not been a good week for the plants bar in Florida. <laughs> I, I did see the... Um, uh, the the interview uh, it, it was a uh, interview with um, uh, the uh, Cole Scott Cassane folks who are my clients as well where one of the Morgan and Morgan people said they should uh, change it for for the people to f the people that, <laughs> that that's how bad this was but what I've seen from the the plaintiff's bar on, on every interview on I mean they're really really ticked and they're almost oh. acting like like DeSantis and his decision here is somehow like reducing justice for the, like he's reptiling people. It's like, it's reducing justice for the general public and everyone's in danger now because yeah. the defense bar, I mean, uh, I, I think that type of um, um, labeling is probably going to persist. Matt, have you guys been able to, when you've been corresponding with clients, um, what what is the clients, the corporate clients or the insurance clients uh, reaction been to this? I, I, I imagine it's very positive on one hand, but I think they're probably going to be in for some great changes as well, right? Uh, I would have to defer to Serena on that. She's been kind of handling that aspect of reaching out to the clients. They don't let you talk to clients. I wonder why. <laughs> not yet. No, not I, yet. I wouldn't. I wouldn't let you talk to any of my. Once we get to the jet, the the playoff game story, people will kind of understand. Yeah, that, yeah. Once, once they find out <laughs> what you did uh, in the stands at that game, they will understand what you are no longer. Well, actually, you just you were never allowed to talk to clients. You're kind of <laughs> I think you're on a probationary uh, cycle here, Matt. Matt, you can earn it back. You can <laughs> I'll get it back. Um, you know, the cli clients are really excited. Um, I think they're in shock um, that they were not expecting this. They it was very sudden. I mean, obviously, the the Florida Defense Lawyers Association has been working with this, has been working with the legislators, and have really um, been wor working with a lot of defense firms to get to this point. Obviously, but um, you know. As a commercial companies, we've been talking for about it for years of how do we get this change? You know, what do we do? Um, and you know, one thing you just said, it's so frustrating. I've been seeing all these articles of how do you tell a mother who's lost her son they can't get anything? I'm thinking, but you can yeah. if your son is at 51% at fault. Like, yeah, I, I don't understand. Why are you, why are you, you, you want to continue to fabricate the, the law here to, you know, people? I don't understand that, but 
but yes. Yeah, this is not going to stop any legitimate claims from coming into the 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 pipeline. This is this is for the frivolous and a, a DeSantis even called us a, a, a legislative hellhole, I believe, in one of his terms. So this is kind of to I think the legislative intent of these HB 837 was to kind of stop the the put a finger in the drain to stop all these yeah. you know over the overflow of all these cases that realistically should have never been brought in the first place i mean listen what i mean i i live in sanford florida you guys know where sanford is what i just drive on i4 to orlando it's it's 15 miles do you know how many plaintiff attorney billboards i see in 15 oh, yeah. miles oh, oh yeah it's you saw the one i texted you this weekend <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, plaintiff attorney, plaintiff attorney, plaintiff attorney, Jesus loves you, you know, sex novelty store, you know, back to plaintiff attorney. That's kind of the rotation of the Florida billboards. I imagine it's the same way in the Jacksonville area, right? It's horrible. It's horrible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But it's, it, it, and so, um, yeah, they're everywhere. And even on my local news, my local news, like the, whatever it is, Channel 6 or whatever, it's sponsored by Newland Law. I mean, the, oh, yeah. it's on the bottom. Uh, the whole Jaguars. News Fair, fair. <laughs> oh, oh, you have no idea. Do you want to hear a true horror story? Um, not really a horror story, but I have children, nine. Uh, hold on. My children are nine, six, and five. I know they're eight. Now you're going to be divorced. <laughs> see? see <laughs> you, weren't, you, weren't, you weren't able to talk to clients. I knew that. I mean, you, no, you get I home, understand here a little bit. <laughs> so, so you're yeah. going to be sleeping on the couch tonight. <laughs> So I have a nine, a six, and a five-year-old. Very impressionable. They very impressionable age, and they love jingles. And my kids were walking around the house going, "Morgan and Morgan for oh. the people oh, no. and I was like, Stop it! You stop it now! <laughs> oh, they, wow. they've, they've infiltrated our youth. <laughs> I, I I would I would say that probably beating your kids at that point is is with its game. It's on. <laughs> I think I, I think that's good. So so Serena, wh how do you think? Because I think it's really important here to. It's like you want to think ahead, but you really this is all this is totally new territory. What are some of the ways that you think a defense firm that can kind of screw this up? Because because they're because I mean, everybody's party and everybody's happening on the defense side. Everybody can screw this up pretty quickly if they don't have their shit together, right? And so I would imagine administratively would be one level, but there may be some other levels too. I well, I think the thing the thing about it is is we're not getting too excited, and and the reason is because there were a hundred thousand lawsuits filed. So yeah. the reality is, you know, like my staff actually came in today and we talked about it. Like, what do you want to do with all these that we know filed? Do we want to go ahead and get everything? Like, go ahead and let's just get everything prepared. Let's get get everything kind of situated. Um, you know. And let's be prepared, like, because I anticipate more coming in, because obviously there are some that are not pre-suit with us, but they're going, they're going to come in from other clients that are now in, in litigation. And so you're going to see a lot of that. You're also going to start seeing, you know, how to differentiate the ones that are now in lit now are coming in um, and understanding the laws changed, you know, you're looking at that differently. Um, and then, you know, Matt and I talked about it today. You know, what happens, um, the the biggest thing is, you know, the Florida Defense Law Association did appeal to, or, and I say appeal, not legally, but did appeal to the Supreme Court and said, hey, look, will you extend us a courtesy of giving us an administrative order to allow extensions for all of these answers to complaints? And of course, the, the plaintiff's bar is like, you asked for it, so stick with it, you know, it's too bad. Um, an administrative order has not been granted at this point, but, you know, now all of these defense firms have to be ready and they have to be prepared to respond to these, um, especially once they get served. So I, I think that there's ways that it can be messed up. We're also concerned, you know, I don't anticipate the plaintiff's bar to go down quietly. Oh, no. So, <laughs> so you know, that's yeah. what Matt and I were talking about today. Like, what's going to come? You what know, they, what, what we're talking, what, you know, what could they do? Could they try to skirt letters of protection to, you know, because, and then another thing is that a way that there's a new added piece of discovery that we haven't talked about, and that's the Worley case. Oh, yeah. Serena, if you want to talk about that, hit on that. Yeah, please. So Worley versus Central Florida of um, YMCA, it's one of the, it, it's a Supreme Court case that now has been overturned, which it was 
one of the probably most frustrating cases in my practice that basically prevented us from gathering information from the plaintiff's attorney regarding their relationship with physicians. We know every single day plaintiff's attorneys send their clients to specific physicians for treatment on and on and on. We, for years, were able to do that. We were able to gather how many times they were going, how many referrals, how much money. I mean, I was using them at trials. All of a sudden, this case comes down to the Supreme Court and says, nope, that's attorney-client privilege. You're no longer entitled to it. So basically, as a defense attorney, I'm required to show my experts and my relationship, but you were not. So that has been overturned. And now they are required to show the same relationship that I, if I use an expert, I mean, essentially it's the same thing. They use the same doctors. They have this relationship with these yeah. doctors. It's a business. It's it a is. Business. And, 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 and states where that is, expo- I, jurors do not like it. Oh, it no. is, it's huge. I mean, yeah, that's, the, that's the whole thing too, is it's not, everyone thinks it's unfair. It's like, no, you're putting the question in front of the jury. Do you believe there's some sort of collusion going on? And yeah. let the jury decide whether they think that a, an attorney who referred thousands of clients to the same doctor who wrote almost identical reports and made, you know, bought a second house, a beach house with those yeah. referrals. Does he have some sort of incentive? It's, it's common sense to me. It's yeah, it's a dirty little secret that, you know, (laughs) nobody wants to talk about, but it's really important. It will have an impact on jury decision making. Well, thank you for both of you for summarizing that bill. That's excellent. Now, let's let's get to some more what what I would just call more um, important questions of this podcast. Uh, Matt, I'm going to start with you because you're I think you're relatively relatively new at the firm. Uh, uh, How would you compare and contrast? The Jacksonville office and the Raleigh office. I mean, maybe from a talent perspective, uh, physical appearance, uh, personality <laughs> style. I just, I just kind of want to get your, you know, because you have multiple offices. I just like to get get our audience to learn about the differences between the uh, Jacksonville and the Raleigh office. Well, I have not yet been to the Raleigh office, and this is probably a lot of, uh, if, if anyone up at the Raleigh office is watching, this is going to be their first experience uh, with me. Uh, as uh, one of their associate attorneys. So I think both offices are great. Uh, pol- politically speaking, I think they both exercise just the, the best judgment and uh, they both have just uh, brimming full of talent. You, you, you just ruined an opportunity there, but Serena's going to jump on. I her. mean, <laughs> really, he sure did. <laughs> <laughs> you said all the right things. <laughs> so all the managing partners who are watching right now yeah <laughs> you're all great <laughs> <laughs> well i've uh, i've been to the raleigh office and um there's there's a good mix of uh acc uh people up there but um but no great office uh great firm uh our mutual friend john nunnally i'm going there next matt don't, don't do that. <laughs> remember most people listen to this they don't get to see this and you're already going this uh, uh this route but no yeah it's, it's a good mix of uh of folks up there our mutual friend john nunnally uh who's a very dear friend of mine who um texts me uh, usually multiple insults uh per day which i fire <laughs> it's already happened all morning right how many times back and forth was he giving yeah. me the business at least matt sticks up for me you know serena not so much um but let, yeah. let's let's go I like back to the- on your own two feet Let's get back to another serious question. Uh, I'm going to start with Matt again, since he's batting a thousand here. Uh, Matt, how, how would you compare and contrast uh, the current status of the Florida State athletic programs and the University of Florida athletic programs? And, and where do you see these two programs going forward in the near future? Well, I guess going with the most recent uh, was baseball, where Florida State happened to lose to the University of Florida. Oh. Um, but overall, I believe we have the winning record uh, dating back to 1956. Florida State uh, has a winning record over Florida in baseball. Um, football. But not we football. Just, well, we just smashed you guys this last season. Uh, basketball. Oh, I don't want to talk about level. basketball. S- Serena, <laughs> don't, don't, don't interrupt counsel's opening statement, please. You just wait. You're, you're getting so your bottle here. It's improper. Casman, proceed. Uh, let's just, I mean, look at, well, okay, so if we're going to go, if we're, if we're judging who has the most felony arrest, then yeah, Florida's, the University oh. of Florida has the oh. most. Oh, oh, <laughs> wow. So yeah, but no, overall, 
Florida State, I think, is just the better program. Uh, we're going to prove it again this year as we did last year. Are we talking scholastic? I mean, academic? <laughs> are we talking football? What exactly are we talking about? We're Matt? talking about athletic programs for now. Athletic programs. <laughs> Uh, so he had to go the criminal route because he can't discuss the academic or the uh, athletic. I thought you would have objected to that because I would have sustained it, but you let it go. So <laughs> open the door. You open the door. So well, now... I'm just, you know, I'm just saying that he had to go that route because clearly he can't go the direct route. So you guys have Tim Tebow, which is a good get. That's, oh, that's, that's just a good... because everyone says you look like him. Well, yeah. you know, I. You know, that's something you got going for you there, uh, Matt. Yeah. Uh, Serena, what, what what do you think the Gators are doing this year? Are they, are they going to get it back together or what? I mean, you're, you're, you're in the same division as Georgia, for crying out loud, and Tennessee. You're kind of just done for the near future. Is that pretty much it? I know. I No, no. I mean, I feel like, I feel like we are getting it back together. Um, although every time I see it, we're getting a new recruit, then we lose them. So, I, you know what? I'm going to... I'm hoping for the best and, you know, we're going to see. I'll I, be feel like a, I feel I'll like see. a mediator here. I, you know, I think I'm going to fall. I think I'm, I, I think I'm going to side here with Matt on Florida state because the ACC is atrocious and Clemson's Clemson's coming down. Uh, the Tar Heels don't have enough, unfortunately. And I, I just see, I see Florida state really uh, getting back on top of the ACC. And I just, I'm sorry. The, the Gators are in just the, most competitive physical conference in the United States. And Did you go to Florida? I I got Did my you? I got my PhD at the University of Florida. Yes. Bill, come on. I was there when the coach was there. Okay. Steve Spurrier, thank you very much. Then you should be supportive. But then I had to go through a year of Ron Zook, which was the <laughs> Ugh. Okay, but, fi fi final. I, mean, <laughs> I believe blue and orange. So okay, I get. We're just gonna let this play out. You guys can come back on in a year. We'll 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 hash wow. it. Out. Um. Okay. So final. So final topic, which is great. So I, uh, pretty much met met you guys uh, at the Jacksonville Jaguar uh, game, which we hung out beforehand. And I gotta tell you, so John has been bugging me to go to an NFL game. And I just keep saying, John, no, John, John, I I'm tired. I travel for a living. Like the last thing I want to do on a Sunday is go to an NFL. I just don't need it. I, I want to relax. I, I, by the way, whoever created NFL red zone, brilliant, brilliant. It's just, Agreed. you sit there and you just don't have to move and you don't miss anything. I like that in my life right now. And he says, yeah, come on, come on. Go. He all year. He did it to me. I'm like, no, 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 no. So then Jacksonville gets in the playoffs, right? Kind of backs into the playoffs, I think. It wasn't exactly, right? It was kind of close. And he's like, I'm getting tickets. We're going. I'm bringing Matt. I'm bringing Serena. And that's my Matt imitation. That's my uh, John imitation. John imitation. I'm bringing Serena. And you're going. And so I just got back from the West Coast. I looked at my wife. I'm like, Kim, I do not want to go to this game. And even my wife's like, you know, Bill, you've, you've turned them down a dozen times. I mean, you got it. And it's a playoff game. I've never been to a playoff game. And so we go to this game and I remember I looked at the, and this is Florida now, right? North Florida. I looked at the temperature. I'm like, like the low is 39 <laughs> that night or 40. And I'm going, this is, this is just not going to be fun. And then the kickoff comes out. And of course it's an 8 PM kickoff. That's about worst case scenario. So I'm just dragging ass up to, I made my wife drive me up there. I brought her with me to stay in a hotel. I was like, you know, I'm knocking down Red Bulls at the bar to stay up. And I meet you guys and we go in and I got to say, it was, it was the worst, um, the worst 30 minutes of football I have ever seen in my life. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm texting my wife going dumbest, dumbest idea ever. I can't believe for, the, for those wondering, it was, it was the chargers game. Right? Yeah. yeah. If anyone was wondering what it was, <laughs> yeah, this, is, this, is, this is the, this is, this is this year. So it's, it's, it's the Jaguars against the chargers. And, um, and we were sitting next to some chargers fan. That, that, that was very interesting. And the, what was the halftime score? Because it was like 27 nothing at one point, right? Yeah. I think it was, I think we ended up. 21 7 or something like that? I, we, we got on the board right before halftime. Yeah. Right before yeah. halftime. I, I'm pretty sure it's like 27 to 7. Yeah. And it was something like that. We were it, eating it, pizza inside. Yes. I, I was like, I'm going thing. inside. They have TVs inside. I completely ditched. I'm like, I can't leave because this is going to look really bad, but I can go in the concourse. Thank you, John, for the club tickets. Go in the concourse. And I can hang out. 
And I remember being up there and there were people up there. These are Jacksonville fans and they're bouncing around like, we're good. We're good. And I looked at the dude. I'm like, you're good. I said, dude, this is a perfectly <laughs> stranger. I go, that's the worst half of football I've ever seen in my life. And he looked right at me because I don't follow the Jet. I don't follow NFL really like I do college. And he goes, we did it against the Cowboys and now we're going to do it to the Chargers. And I was thinking, I'm like, you know, wait a second. A couple weeks ago, they were down to the Cowboys really big and came back and won this big, uh, won this big game. And so the second half of this game was complete chaos. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, miracle, epic, epic comeback. And once it started happening, I remember I leaned over to you guys. I'm like, listen, like five things got to happen for this comeback to happen. <laughs> five. And if you miss one of them, you're not winning this game. And then like three in a row happened. I'm going, oh my God. Oh my God. You got God. very oh clinical God. with your explanation. <laughs> Thank you very much. But Wherever Lawrence needs to do this, the defense needs to do this, the kicker needs to do, and then it just... I and think I it started, I think it started off with you and Matt, me, Matt and I. Though I think we we set it, we set the yeah. Stage. You you did you 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 did set the tone. Um, and then as as the comeback looks imminent, right? I, people are going bananas. This place is absolutely nuts. Of course, at forty degrees, Matt has to rip his shirt off, and he's doing the whole waving uh, thing, going crazy. I I kept all my clothes on. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, another yeah, again, that's the top reason you're not going to client meetings just yet, Matt. Um, but, but that was really, that was really a, a incredible um, uh, uh, game. It was an incredible experience. And then the funniest part of the story, which I laughed all the way home was Matt, your, your buddy left the game. Oh, now, awesome. there's, there's always one guy that, you yep. know, that like you're, and, and so, and he's a diehard fan and just quickly tell our audience, he, did he leave at halftime? Yeah, yeah, so uh, I'll just give him a full shout out here. Free plug. Austin Gray of Gray Home Inspections and Gray Pest Control, local <laughs> business owner, uh, during the Chargers <laughs> game, left at halftime because the Jags were down so bad. The weather was terrible. It was cold. And yeah. uh, had texted me at halftime. I said, hey, where are you at? And he sent me a picture on the road and said, going home. And, and oh, man, did we let him have it. <laughs> Yeah, and that he was went one of those. To the final, he went to the next playoff game too. And, like, and to, to make up for it, he did travel to the yeah. next to the to the next. I think it was. I feel like we should have deserved those tickets because we stayed. We yeah. were. The we should have made Austin bias playoff tickets in Kansas yeah. City. I know. Uh, Tr Which Trevor sure Lawrence hats 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 off to him. Fun time. Hopefully, we can do that again uh, next year. Uh, we'd love to do a playoff game. Uh, but any game, uh, but guys, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast today. This is a really, really important topic. Again, we're going to post this as soon as possible because this is the, uh, we've had a couple of emergency podcasts, uh, but this is really, really important. And uh, we're probably going to hit this topic again. So I'd love to have you back on at some point because as this plays out, I think new things will pop up. And I think you're exactly right, guys, both of you. You said they're not going down easy. They're not going down easy. This is going to be some kicking, scratching, scorched earth. Um, they're not going to just, you know, take this L and just walk back to the locker room. Uh, there are going to be some issues, and we'll see how those play out. But thank you very much uh, for both being uh, on the podcast. And to our audience members, thank you so much uh, for participating in another edition of this emergency edition of the Litigation Psychology Podcast brought to you by Courtroom Sciences. I am Dr. Bill Kanaski. See you next time.